There are definitely some solid reasons to not buy a new EV this year. You don't want one, or you can't afford one. Those are two really good reasons, especially the not being able to afford one, since the average new vehicle cost in America is significantly below the average new EV cost in America. That tends to be pretty darn high. But the reason that I hear the most often is charging infrastructure just isn't there yet. It's all about the charging infrastructure. I would only buy an EV if I could do X, Y, or Z with my charging infrastructure. If only I had a charging infrastructure near me. Well, I'm kidding a little bit, but that's basically what some people are saying. Even colleagues of mine in the industry that are generally fans of EVs say, well, you know, I thought about buying an EV, this car buying decision. And even though I own my own home and I live in suburbia, I chose to do something else because I'm worried about the charging infrastructure. Let's take a deeper dive into that. Remember that most of your charging happens at home with an EV and a lot of charging happens at the office. I would argue this is a topic for a separate video, that most of your charging actually should be happening at the office because that's when green power is really doing its thing. You'll find that the most renewable sources, basically solar, when that really comes on the boil, it's going to be earlier in the day. That's also when we're producing a lot more power than we're using, generally speaking, as a society. Take a look at California's grid, for instance. There's a lot of renewable power going on in the pre-noon hour, and that's when California's charging their battery packs. They're kind of spinning down some of the other power sources, etc. And then it's the afternoon when things get warmer and people want to use their air conditioning that the prices and the demand actually start increasing. And then, of course, at night, the sun is not shining, so this is probably not the best time to plug in your EV if you want to source your power from green resources. But general demand is low, so people seem to charge their EVs at night pretty much all the time anyway. But again, that's a topic for a different video. We're simply talking about this infrastructure thing. Now, a little tale here back in time. In 2016, I bought an EV that definitely had an infrastructure problem. It was a Kia Soul EV. Now, I bought the Soul EV because I couldn't afford a Tesla Model S, and there weren't very many other EVs out there on the market. But the Soul EV was the kind of EV that did have an infrastructure problem. In a logical world, lots of us would be running around in tiny battery EVs. Soul's EV battery was you know, about that big, and only had about 90 miles of electric range. That was not a lot compared to a Tesla Model S with 300 miles of range back then. And making matters worse, the Soul EV didn't exactly charge fast. It also used the Chatamo charging connector, which is the funky standard that basically everybody has abandoned in North America. The ultimate problem with the Soul EV is that 90 miles didn't get you very far, and there were times that I wanted to drive 90 miles somewhere, and then I had to charge all the way up and then drive 90 miles back. That was definitely a pain. But we don't live in that world anymore because Tesla was right, and people want long-range EVs. As nonsensical as that may be, why are we lugging around an enormous battery that you're using incredibly rarely? You'd be better suited, environmentally and economically, to buy an EV with a smaller battery and charge it more often. But that's not how we work. So now we live in a world where 100 kilowatt hour battery packs are absolutely normal. You'll find one in a Mach-E, you'll find them in a bunch of Teslas, and then bigger battery packs, much bigger battery packs are out there as well. The F-150 Lightning has a 131 kilowatt hour battery pack. The Hummer EV and the upcoming Chevy trucks are gonna have 212 kilowatt hour battery packs. These battery packs are absolutely enormous. And these EVs don't have as much of an infrastructure problem because the vast majority of charging, again, is happening, guess what, at home or at the office, with a large part at home. Yes, this is going to be a problem if we want to expand EV adoption in the United States, because outside of single family homeowners, infrastructure, yeah, it's going to be a problem. But it's not the problem for the people that are actually buying EVs right now. The vast majority of EV buyers, whether we're talking about a Chevy Volt or a Porsche Taycan, they're being purchased by single family homeowners. And that is borne out by most of the data that we find from Chevy, from Hyundai, from General Motors, etc., that they are willing to share with the press. They won't give us specifics, but they will say that the vast majority are single family homeowners. And that's pretty much what we see with Tesla as well. And this is why I think the infrastructure thing is not exactly a chicken and egg problem. It really is more of like a chicken is already laying eggs kind of thing. Because if people out there that don't have an infrastructure problem are buying new EVs and then occasionally using public charging infrastructure, 
whenever it suits them for whatever reason, then you're going to be getting better public infrastructure over time. Let's take a look and see exactly how EVs tend to get used. An interesting point of data here is our very unscientific poll on this channel and on the Alex and Autos channel and on Facebook, where I asked people, how are you currently charging your EV if you own one? About one third of respondents said that they're just using the level one charge cord. And that makes a lot of sense because of the people that I personally know that own EVs, I know a lot of them, a lot of them are using the level one charge cord. And that includes several Tesla owners, a Chevy Bolt owner who happens to be my next door neighbor. So shout out to them if they're watching. They work just fine on the level one charge cord. And a lot of folks think, how is this remotely possible? Here's the deal. So say you drive the average daily commute in America, which is up versus 2018. So the last data we have from the census says average daily commute is 55 miles. That's definitely a long one, although not as long as I once used to commute. At any rate, so 54 miles. Say we have a 300 mile range EV. Let's take, I don't know, a Ford Mustang Mach-E or a Tesla with a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack that gets 300 miles of range. These are two really good examples. A lot of folks will say, well, I can't recharge my battery to 100%, so therefore I have an infrastructure problem, I have a charging problem. Oh my God, my world has come to an end. That's not really how you should look at this, I would argue. So Monday you start out, your battery is full, 300 miles of range. You drive to the office, you drive home, you have 245 miles left. You plug it in at night, you're charging at about 1.2 to 1.4 kilowatts, and you'll gain about 29 miles of range overnight. So, oh my God, it's not going to be full. I come back in the morning and my car is only 90 something percent. Well, yeah, but... 90 something percent of a battery this big will still get you to the work and to home with absolutely no problem. And you'll return and be fully charged on Tuesday morning with 274 miles of range. Now that's gonna drop as you drive, 248 miles, Thursday, 222 miles, Friday, 196 miles. But then you'll get home at the end of Friday, plug it in and have all the way till Monday to recharge the battery perhaps a little bit less depending on exactly what you're doing over the weekend, but you come home in on Friday late, you still have 44 hours to charge the vehicle and more than 44 hours until you have to get back to work. Some of you might think that charging your EV this way is more or less academic, but I assure you it's not. My next door neighbor does just this. And in fact, when he got his Chevy Bolt, the two of us had a lot of conversations about it and I helped him get that Bolt in the first place. I was really taken aback by his plan to only use level one charging. And now many years later, he is still just fine with it. And when I thought more about it, I tend to operate with my EVs in a very similar fashion. I tend to drive them from home to the office and back and forth like that. I generally only charge at the office and I don't necessarily charge every day. I'll plug it in when it's down around 20% or so. Of course, if you're one of those people that's not really willing to sit there and watch your state of charge just rumble down there towards the end of the week, you could get a relatively inexpensive, say, 24 amp EVSE, 240 volt one, that'll charge around five kilowatts or so. And that will recoup your average daily use in pretty much every modern EV in under four hours. The more efficient your EV, the less power it's gonna need and the less time it will spend plugged in. So if instead of say, one of those big 100 kilowatt hour battery pack EVs, say you bought a Chevy Bolt and you got four miles per kilowatt hour, you'd spend 25% less time at the charger. Now about public charging infrastructure, that is just a tiny bit trickier. Obviously getting your employer to install an EVSC at the office, that would really be great, but that's something that you can have an effect on right now by asking your employer to do that, or would they consider do that? Would they plan for that in the future? Now, when it comes to DC fast charging, that is a little bit trickier. I generally don't DC fast charge very, very often. And for me, most of my interactions with DC fast charging have been okay. There are certainly issues to keep in mind with that though. So if you plan on road tripping frequently, then this is a concern, but that doesn't really describe the average EV owner and the average EVs use case. The average electric vehicle doesn't just wake up on a random Wednesday, or I should say the average EV owner, not the EV, and suddenly decide they want a road trip from New York to San Francisco or vice versa. Generally, there, there are more planned out trips, you do hear about people getting stuck in hurricanes, et cetera, because of public charging infrastructure. I would argue maybe now is not the time to have an only EV family. You know, you could. There are definitely going to be some of those considerations if you live in an area where hurricane evacuations are going to be a thing. You might want to consider only having one EV in the family and having a regular gasoline vehicle. Or you might want to consider flying or doing something else for that road trip. You will be able to do it. It will require more planning. And I would argue that 
all the public charging infrastructure in the world is not going to change that too much. We could see a rapid explosion in DC charging in the United States, but there would also be a corresponding rapid explosion in demand for EVs, so it's probably going to be fairly similar. The reality is that owning an EV is going to require you to think about your vehicle differently. Now, coupled with the whole public charging infrastructure thing, we see a lot of comments on electric grid utilization. Even by the wildest estimates that we see out there, and this one would be from McKenzie's study here, uh, they claim that if California meets the 2030 goal for electrification, 5% of the grid's demand tops would be electric vehicles. That's not an enormous increase, and that is something that could be fixed between now and then. Now, will it be fixed now and then? That is a different question. But there is historic precedence for these kinds of increases in demand on the grid. Just look at when air conditioning was invented and we saw a massive rise in electric demand in the south of the United States. We could see something similar with electric vehicles, but it's probably not going to be quite as rapid because electric vehicles are much more expensive than the average air conditioning unit. So it's going to take a lot more time until that many more people have an electric vehicle out there. It's definitely not a non-issue, but it's not the biggest issue because the demand is going to rise relatively slowly. And a combination of demand and electric rates will definitely help you decide when you should be charging your EV. At any rate, that's my random EV thought for the day. Leave your feedback down there in the comments section and let me know, do you have an infrastructure problem with your EV or are you worried about it? I don't think it's a problem to be worried about it, but I would say that now is the time to start thinking rationally and really think about where you'll be plugging in, how you'll be plugging in, how you realistically use your vehicle. If you're worried about road trips, sit down and ask the question, how often did we road trip in the last two years, three years, four years? And if the answer is, never, then it's probably not the biggest problem with your upcoming vehicle purchase. And I'm always the first to say, if this is still a problem for you, then don't get an EV. We certainly have that option still in the United States. EVs only represent about 3% of the new vehicles sold in the US. So that leaves 97% of the vehicles out there as valid options for you if you can't make this work. Or you can always try a plug-in hybrid. See all of you later.